So as part of the propaganda effort, you have to suppress that. And that's what was part of this. And so, you know, the battle was fought in the 1980s. Oddly gets revived by his efforts in 96. Ultimately, the CIA admits to the crimes in, in 98, but the CIA admissions are almost go unreported. There is a front page piece in the New York Times which sort of says, yeah, well, I guess there was more to it than we originally thought, but kind of a grudging piece. The LA, the LA Times never reported on the uh, on volume two and its content, despite the fact that uh, much of the, of the story affected LA directly. The Washington Post did a kiss-off story of several weeks after this remarkable report came out. Uh, that's one reason at Consortium News, we were, I was writing about this and I included in uh, the details in my book, Lost History, which follows you know, what, the, what the U.S. government ultimately admitted to. It's an extraordinary development, but one that has never really penetrated the American consciousness the way it should have, in part because of the, the, the successful propaganda apparatus that this chapter addresses. And they actually successfully destroyed uh, the career and ultimately the life of Gary Webb for his efforts, too. Right. But you right. talked about earlier about how in the 1980s, too, they went about destroying the careers of journalists who were actually doing their job. These aren't just abstractions. These are real people. In the case of Gary Webb, he was driven to suicide over this. Right. He was Gary Webb, after he did his piece series in, in 96, and actually my only criticism of Gary's piece, and I actually told him this myself, was he didn't go nearly far enough. You know, he was, he was being attacked, obviously, for going too far, but the truth was he was much worse than what he described. It wasn't just one channel of drugs into the Los Angeles and, uh, and the San Francisco Bay Area. It was, there, were, there were lines of, of drugs going to Miami, into, into Texas, you know, around the country. Hey, what about Arkansas? Well, I've always thought that was a sidelight that wasn't that people focus on way too much. The Mina stuff is kind of a, a sideshow, which, which got more attention than it deserved. Because but it did happen. There was the cocaine going in, Dan Lasseter there, and all that. Well, I mean, no, I don't agree with that part. I think there... There was a there was an operation at, at Mena, but it was a you know really a minor thing, and it was not you know this idea that Bill Clinton was involved is a lot of nonsense. It's just a conspiracy theory, but which was pushed very heavily by this propaganda operation, but it was not real. Uh, the but there was some there was some element of truth there, but it was didn't involve Clinton, which has always been the problem. People want to throw Clinton into this, yeah. and that was made up story. But but as far as uh, airplanes landing at the the yeah, airstrip, there, there was there was a small operation in Mena. There, it was being used in part to help train some of the Contra pilots. As part of the propaganda operation, the Reagan administration tried to frame the Sandinistas, ironically, on drug trafficking. And one of the one of the great ironies here is that that there really were no drugs going through Nicaragua at the time, at least to speak of, because the U.S. government had had Nicaragua really under heavy surveillance because there was there were suspicions they were running guns to other guerrilla groups and so forth. So there was no real reason why, if you were a drug lord in South America, you'd want to send your stuff through Nicaragua, which had almost no trade relations with the United States and was under heavy surveillance. It made much more sense to go through Costa Rica, to Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, any place but Nicaragua. But the Reagan administration wanted to, as part of the propaganda, pin this thing on the Nicaraguans, on the Sandinistas. There was only one captured shipment of cocaine during this entire period that went through Nicaragua, and that was flown in by the United States as part of one of these sting operations. It landed in, in Nicaragua. It, the plane was shot down. A second plane had to go in and pick up the, the, so the supply of cocaine to fly it back out, and then they, they released some big public relations stunt saying the Sandinistas were responsible, but they weren't. This was this operation out of MENA, the U.S. government sting operation that was meant as a propaganda ploy. So no. while the Contras really were doing the drugs, and we really couldn't talk about that in Washington without getting our heads handed to us. We were supposed to talk about how the Sandinistas were doing the drugs when they really weren't. And not that they were nice people, but it made no financial sense for the drug lords to use them. And secondly, the simple fact is, except for that one shipment that was the U.S. government shipment, there were no, never any drugs captured coming through Nicaragua. 
Robert, would you say the uh, story in the 1990s pushed by Lori Milroy and Judy Miller that Ramzi Youssef, the guy who cooked the bomb for the first World Trade Center, was actually secretly an Iraqi intelligence agent and so forth, would that be this very same propaganda network that you're talking about? Well, I mean, obviously things tend to morph and change, and and it becomes sometimes not as clear cut. Yeah. And even what we're talking about with the Contra operation, there was if you if you read this chapter and you see how it was done, there's a lot of uh, misdirection that's put into it. Uh, since you're using a lot of private individuals, you know, Oliver North might give a speech to one of them. They might be encouraged to give money to some private group, which then goes out and attacks say, Congressman uh, Michael Barnes, who was one of their, the problem congressmen at the time. So that things are often, you know, it's hard to sort of track it all precisely through. And, I, and things, as I say, evolve over time. And I, I just don't know if there were certainly efforts to create other hysterias. And, and the key point of why this is relevant to today is what we saw in, in 2002 and 2003, which was the same kind of program to exaggerate the danger facing the American people from an external threat. In the 1980s, we were supposed to think that the Sandinistas were going to take Texas uh, or they were going to capture the Panama Canal. Those are two themes that were thrown out. I remember people uh, repeating what Reagan had said. I, didn't, I never heard Reagan saying it. I was a little kid. But I remember people repeating him saying that, uh, Whatever, I forget. It was only a one-day drive from Harlingen, Texas. Yeah, there you go. They're closer to Texas than we are here in D.C., something like that, yeah. Right. So we're supposed to be very fearful. And if if anyone visited Nicaragua during that time, and I did as a journalist, it was a a, a very poor third-world country. We we used to talk about how they had maybe one working elevator in the entire country. The idea that that they were going to do any of these things uh, was absurd. Uh, I was at one once at a briefing at the Pentagon where where they were selling us on this idea that there was nothing to stop the uh, Sandinista army from marching down and capturing the Panama Canal. And I asked somewhat puckishly, you know, mightn't the 82nd Airborne show up? You know, the idea that some peasant, <laughs> some peasant army was going to just, you know, march through countries and go take the Panama Canal was absurd. But we were supposed to be very afraid of this. And if you remember, there was even fear being ginned up about the Grenadians, you know, the little, little island of Grenada, that, that was gonna, they were going to spread terrorism all around the hemisphere. Mm-hmm. These were like this, what we were seeing was what was then refined and perfected in, 19, in 2002 when, when we were then pitched the dangers from Iraq. They have weapons of mass destruction. That is what this war was about. Saddam Hussein possesses biological and chemical weapons. The fact that there are weapons there. You've heard the president say repeatedly that he has chemical and biological weapons. That Saddam Hussein still has chemical and biological weapons, and he is moving ever closer to developing a nuclear weapon. Iraq has a growing fleet of manned and unmanned aerial vehicles. High-strength aluminum tubes suitable for nuclear weapons production. Thousands of tons of chemical agents 500 tons of sarin, mustard, and VX nerve agent continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. They have weapons of mass destruction. That is what this war was about. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use against our friends, against our allies, and against us. Saddam Hussein is a homicidal dictator who is addicted to weapons of mass destruction. They have weapons of mass destruction. That is what this war was about. And you even had cases on the Iraqi side, if you remember some of this, they were going to use these unmanned aircraft, these so-called UAVs, and they were going to fly over the United States and spray us with uh, deadly chemical weapons. Now, of course, these, these UAVs, which are almost like model airplanes, yeah, could, not, wooden could, string. could not get anywhere even you know, to the Mediterranean Sea, let alone across the Atlantic to, to the United States. But That was one of my favorites, too. So some of these things are, are really absurd, but, they are, but they're presented very seriously by this media we have. Fox News will get all worked up about it. And if Fox News gets worked up about it, MSNBC and CNN, you better believe it, they're going to be more worked up about it.